coming. I would like to call to order the Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, March 4th, 2015. Mr. Aho, would you please call the roll? Mr. Stuber? Here. Mrs. Kane Criswell? Here. Mrs. Davis? Here. Mrs. Pearl Waldron? Here. Mr. Felber? Here. Now, if I could ask everyone to please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we get into our reports, I have one piece of housekeeping for the board tonight, so please bear with me. Uh, under agenda item E, we do have some uh, changes to our agenda, just some minor revisions for the board. I would like to make the motion that regarding exhibit I-2, that what is referenced for Bonnie Vadine, the effective date should be March 5th, 2015. It's showing 2014 in the agenda, so the change is to change that to 2015. That's just a typo. Also, within this motion, if you flip over to Sandra Guest, this is under leave of absence. Um, it should not say bus driver transportation. That should say lunchroom playground assistant at Biffin. So those are the changes to exhibit I-2 in the agenda. Is there a second for that motion, please? Second by Mr. Felber. Any further questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Stuber? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. Mrs. Kane Criswell? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Pearl Waldron? Yes. Well, thanks for putting up with that. Good evening and thanks for attending. Um, you know, I've been saying it here meeting after meeting about the cold weather, and when I got up this morning and went to work and got out of the car, I thought, you know, I know it's going to be colder tomorrow, but maybe we've just turned the corner on this weather and things are getting better. And we can forget about these calamity days that uh, poor Mrs. Powers has to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to figure out. So, In our agenda tonight, I, I do want to draw your attention to one very important and very exciting thing for the district. Um, and this is listed under the superintendent's report. Uh, last week, the state auditor, David Yost, visited our district and presented the Auditor of the State Award with distinction to our finance staff. So I would like to say in the President's report here an early congratulations to Mr. Aho, our Treasurer, and also his staff, John Framatino, Nancy Wagner, and also Donna Kelly. Uh, it's reassuring uh, on the Board to know that we have competent and dedicated people on our finance team who are keeping the accounting side of the school business in good order. So congratulations, Marty, to you and your team on a job well done. Uh, recognition is well deserved, and I know we'll have more of that in the superintendent's report. Also within the topic of financial matters is the recently released draft of the state biennial budget, which is known as House Bill 64. For those who have attended board meetings regularly and watched on uh, the cable channel, I'm, I apologize if I sound like a broken record, as you have heard me voice this concern frequently over the last few months. And it's also a topic that I've communicated publicly for the entire time that I've been on the board. However, there are many in the community who are just now becoming aware of the school funding challenges that we have faced and continue to deal with. And unfortunately, the topic related to the state budget that has been the most concerning for our district is back in the table again and that's the reduction of the TPP reimbursement funds. The proposed state budget over the next two years, and again, this is the proposal, would reduce the TPP reimbursement to our district over the two-year period by over $1 million. A significant source of revenue to school districts had been the tangible personal property tax, or known as the TPP. Back in 2006, the TPP tax revenue was worth approximately $9.8 million to this school district, or almost 25% of our revenue. However, in 2006, when House Bill 66 took effect, it eliminated the TPP tax and replaced it with a state-controlled tax known as the Commercial Activities Tax, or the CAT tax. Although the state has provided some reimbursement for the lost TPP tax to school districts, the intention of the legislation 
has always been to eventually eliminate the entire tax revenue that was originally derived from the PPP tax. Ultimately, what the state has done is replace a local tax known as the TPP tax with a state-controlled tax called the CAT tax. And through this process, they have redirected funds away from school districts and into the state's general fund. Since House Bill 66 was enacted, Twinsburg has seen a decrease of over $3 million in the total reimbursement of this TPP revenue. Our district has been trimming costs for many years. Soon after House Bill 66 was voted into law, back in 2005, the district's administrative team began presenting this information to the public and began trimming low-hanging fruit. And as we've traveled through the past few years, the cuts have been deeper. During 2010 and 2011, the district enacted staff reductions that were done through attrition, and it was the result of retirements and resignations and positions that we chose not to fulfill. And over those period of, that period of time, those two years, uh, those changes were worth about a million dollars along with some other operational cost reductions. The operational change plan that was implemented during the 2012-2013 years also had a neutralizing effect on the PPP revenue that had been phased out and those action actions did stabilize the reduction of our cash reserve. While it is too early at this point to clearly determine the financial impact that the proposed state budget will have for our district, we will continue to monitor the discussion and we will continue to voice our concerns to the appropriate legislators. Mrs. Powers, Mr. Aho, and myself, uh, we met with Representative Christina Rogner just this week and we did discuss the proposed state budget. Uh, this week, the board will submit a formal letter to the governor which expresses our concern regarding school funding and specifically the topic of the TPP reimbursement. Next month, several districts are going to send their representatives, being the superintendent, treasurers, board presidents, and vice presidents, to a meeting that will be held with Representative Rogner, Representative Slavey, and Senator LaRose to discuss the proposed state budget and funding for education. So we'll continue to report on this issue and keep the community informed as the state budget uh, proposal evolves. Another very important topic of interest is regarding the Common Core and the asso uh, associated standardized testing. Two weeks ago, our students began taking the state mandated standardized test known as the Park Assessment. The in initiation of this activity has resulted in renewed discussion regarding the Common Core standards and standardized testing. Standardized testing in our schools has been around for many years. Our experienced educators, such as Mrs. Powers and our building principals and classroom teachers, will tell you that they've seen several changes over the years, and the latest change to move towards the Common Core Standards and the associated standardized testing called PARC is another example of the evolution and progression toward a goal of helping students become college and career ready. Of specific interest for all school districts, has been the issue of the amount of time students and teachers are spending on the exams and preparation. As we have reported during the past year, this district is in favor of modifications to the standardized testing process that would reduce the time spent on testing and allow teachers more time in the classroom for teaching. The legislators have been debating this issue in Columbus since last fall, and this is a topic that has had Mrs. Powers' attention as she's traveled to Columbus to advocate on our behalf for revisions to the testing process and reduction in the time that has been spent so that we can apply more teaching time in the classroom. During our meeting this week with Representative Rogner, we discussed a new bill referred to as House Bill 74. It's been introduced to address the excessive amount of time that's being required for standardized tests. It should be noted that there's also related legislation in the state Senate known as Senate Bill 3, which also addresses the amount of time spent on student testing. Another bill that has received attention is House Bill 7. As presented, this bill does not have teeth. And this board declined to place support behind a meaningless bill. However, a recent amendment provides some reason for hope that this bill now includes an amendment which contains language that would protect districts from losing state foundation funding if students choose to opt out of the standardized testing. A note, however, that this does not address the potential loss of federal funding for such things such as the Title I grants. As I stated, our superintendent has been actively engaged with legislators in Columbus, 
uh, regarding these topics, and she will continue to work along with other superintendents across the state to ensure that testing that is required makes sense and provides value to our teaching staff and our students. As a result of these es is, uh, excuse me, efforts this evening, under new business, the board will consider action to adopt the resolution that states our position. There's certainly much to observe at the state level that may have a direct impact locally, and we will continue to report on these issues during upcoming board meetings. And this evening, we're once again reminded of why we are here, as we recognize students for their achievements. And thus, a special welcome to the staff, students, and families from Bissell Elementary and the R.B. Chamberlain Middle School. I know that you're here tonight for some very special recognition. So without further delay, I would like to turn the meeting over to Mrs. Powers for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good evening, Board of Education. Good evening, family. It's always so nice to see all of our students and our parents out to celebrate some wonderful students and some great accomplishments, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, we have on our agenda this evening um, Mr. Corey from the State um, Auditor's Office, and Mr. Ahill, I don't see that he has arrived yet. I don't see him either. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to uh, detour then and come back uh, to this in the agenda if Mr. Corey does in fact arrive um, during the meeting this evening. So it's indeed um, our pleasure, Marty. Uh, this is a huge uh, honor for you. and and the fact that you're so diligent in making sure that our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed and that we're good stewards of the taxpayer's dollar here in our school district. So even though Mr. Corey's not here, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us, all our students and our staff, and of course the residents of the Chinsburg City School District because I know how hard you work and how diligent your efforts are making sure that we do right by those uh, finances that have been invested. So uh, if you please join me in congratulating Marty on this fine honor. Hopefully Mr. Corey does arrive and uh, we could uh, present Marty with his award at that point in time. Uh, Board of Education, it has been a very, very busy week here in the school district. It's right to read week. It's uh, a fun time over at Wilcox Primary School. I got to read this morning to Mrs. DeCola's and Miss uh, Washington's kids and we all read about peanut butter and uh, cupcake, a pretty cool story. And I got a, a thank you book and a photo of me and the kids and it was just great. And you know, there's nothing like the enthusiasm of our, our little ones in the classroom. So uh, parents, thank you for sharing that enthusiasm with us every day. Um, speaking of enthusiasm, yesterday was the first of three days of kindergarten registration. And so parents, if you have a little one at home who will be five uh, by August 1st, please visit our website at um, www.twinsburg.com that k12.oh.us and find the information about uh, kindergarten registration. We would love to get all of our kids registered before the first day of school. So please do pay attention to that and uh, we have two more days of registration coming up here in March. Uh, Board of Education, I would like to show um, up on our screens this evening the survey that we're asking our residents and community members and parents to look for, you know, Board of Education, we are undergoing a facilities assessment this year, and we're looking for lots and lots of information from our families. Uh, Jen is going to show us that on our district website, um, under what's happening, there's a little article there about the Board of Education's goal for the year, um, looking for feedback about our grounds <coughs> and our facilities. So she's going to click the Read More section, and it's going to take you to our uh, simple little survey but the simple little survey is going to glean for us a lot of great information if the survey would like to work here tonight. Okay, well then. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, if you visit our website and you go to that link, um, I guess it's not going to work either. First Mr. Corey and now the website. I don't know. We're in trouble. Um, Anyhow, if you go there, parents, and please do, we are looking for your input about your um, thoughts about our district facilities, our grounds, um, whether or not you're, you believe that we're doing a good job with maintaining the investment that you have provided for us um, for the school district, uh, your thoughts about our use of technology here in the school district, um, and how we compare to other school districts that you may be aware of. Uh, this particular link on the website will be available uh, when it works through uh, Monday. <laughs> it's the wireless here. 
Anyhow, um, it's going to be available to our residents through Monday, March 16th. So please do take a moment, and it's very simple. Uh, we just ask you to uh, click on and uh, provide some feedback. And then what we're going to do with all that feedback is we have uh, begun to uh, create these huge spreadsheets of information. We have been around town talking with our staff, talking with the senior citizens, talking with the elected officials, talking with community members at large, gathering a lot of input and feedback about Twinsburg City School District buildings and grounds. And once we have all that information put together, we then have the charge of creating a strategic plan so that moving forward into time, we are continuing to pay attention to what's important to you, our residents, and making sure that we have the very best facilities and grounds for all of the students who that uh, go to our schools. And um, everybody's opinion is important, so please take the time to uh, click on the survey and let us know what you think. So thank you, Jen, sorry. You. Internet's great when it works. Okay, um, Board of Education, I also wanted to talk with you this evening about a topic that has um, come front and center because of the latest uh, round of state assessments. Um, we have been asked the question a couple of times of late about FERPA and about um, student privacy. And I'd like to read from my script this evening because I want to make sure I get this right and uh, provide the information that's important for our families to know. Excuse me. In Ohio, certain student data is reported to each school district through the state's education management information system, and we call it EMIS. If you're a school person, you know that EMIS is the uh, database for all of our information. Student data is reported via a statewide student identifier known as an SSID. That's a nondescript number that's attached to each of our students. Uh, but Ohio law prohibits uh, the school district reporting of a student's name, address, and or social security number to the State Board of Education or the Ohio Department of Education. Public school district data are protected under the Federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA, and FERPA and its regulations apply to all schools that receive funds under an applicable program of the U.S. Department of Education. And the counterpart to FERPA in Ohio is found in the Ohio Revised Code. The Superintendent of Public edu Education, who's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Richard Ross, recently released a document called a Data Privacy Report, and that was released in December of 14. In that report, uh, Dr. Ross outlines the student data reporting system. This report can be easily accessed via the ODE's website at www.education.ohio.gov. Please note that Ohio is one of only three states that does not collect student names as part of their K-12 student data system. The report includes a helpful chart listing the types of data reported and not reported to EMA. So parents who had specific questions about what's being reported and not, um, I invite you to take a look at the ODE's website and find Dr. Ross's report. It's called Data Privacy Report, and it was released in December 14. The Ohio Department of Education con contracts with assessment vendors to provide student registration, assessment login, scoring, and reporting services and requires those vendors to agree to specific terms and conditions in their contracts to ensure the protection of student data and to ensure vendors are following state and federal privacy laws. Specifically, the Ohio Department of Education requires vendors to comply with the State of Ohio Security Standard, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which covers the implementation of security controls. The Ohio Department of Education also requires vendors to comply with FERPA. The Twinsburg City School District works very hard to protect students' personally identifiable information. Board of Education, if I might just take a few more moment, moments, I would like to provide for you an, an example of how this recently occurred. Uh, as our parents know, uh, we are serious about making sure that we do right by our children. And um, you know that uh, recently our school district began to uh, assess our kids with something called the MAP assessments. And the MAP assessment is a, a test, it's a diagnostic assessment that we um, offer our students a couple times of the year. It allows us to see how students are growing over time, especially in math and in reading, language arts, and also in science. Well, one of the things about using the MAP assessments is that we were able to connect the students' growth measure, how much they grew over a year, to uh, teachers' evaluations through something called value added. Uh, teachers at uh, Wilcox and at Bissell 
uh, do not have the state assessments except for Bissell having um, OAA and now Park the third grade. But for last year and this year's teacher evaluations are based on last year's value added information. So we use the MAP assessments at Wilcox and Bissell to help us determine how well the students grew and how that would be affecting teacher evaluation. Well, this year when we got the information, the contract to sign, um, Mrs. Farthing and I noticed that there was something a little bit askew about the contract. And in fact, they had changed the language from a year ago when we used this particular contract. And some of the things that were of concern to us are the following. Um, a contract stated that the, um, the vendor, this time it was Battelle for Kids, um, would have a license uh, that would uh, be used as a perpetual license, which means that the information would be used by Bat Patel forever, basically, and that they would be using it for educational research and evaluation. The agreement also said that Patel wanted our students' demographic information, including the SSID information, and, th and that was kind of curious to us. And then the agreement also said that the district uh, would have to hold Patel harmless in the event that there was some negligence with that information. So uh, Jen and I kind of scratched our heads and said, this is an odd kind of agreement. So we forwarded it to our legal counsel. And legal counsel helped us to revise the contract language. Um, and we sent it back to Battelle. Well, most interesting of all, Battelle has since told us, if you don't agree to our language, then we're going to go our separate ways. And so we have. So I just uh, bring that forward as an example because we take this student privacy information extremely seriously. Um, we know that uh, it would be very easy to sign on the dotted line and get, and get this contract, send our student information off and get these reports that would make it an easier thing for the district to be able to determine a teacher's evaluation because of value added. But it's not the right thing to do. And so uh, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do for next year because, again, this value-added information is a year old. And so as we look to figure out what we're going to do for next year's teacher evaluations, we'll be working with our teachers union and with our administrative team to figure that out. But I just wanted to bring that forward to you because I know Board of Education, there are lots of questions about FERPA and student inf information and how it's being used. And I can assure you, if it's a contract that the Board of Education has here in our school district and we're asked to sign on the dotted line, we just don't do it and make it an easy thing to be done. We make sure that we're protecting the rights of our children as far as we can, taking our responsibilities to the, to the end goal and making sure that we're doing right by your kids. So again, Board of Education, I just uh, I apologize for being a little long-winded tonight, but um, it's work that we take very seriously and I wanted to make sure that our parents understood that. Um, finally, Board of Education, uh, Mr. Subert did a great job this evening talking about all the House bills, House Bill 7 before and 7 and 3, and uh, we have been very, very busy in Columbus. I spend a lot of time up and down 71. I think the car can probably go by itself now. Um, but I do want to say that we are very concerned about this budget bill. And parents, I invite you to take a look at my superintendent's link on the website. Um, you will understand our position uh, taking a look at that. We invite you to contact uh, Christina Rogner or Frank LaRose and please provide your input about the financial picture here in our school district. We have done a lot here to take care of what we have to take care of our business. Mr. Aho's award tonight is the fact that we're paying attention to the bottom line. We know that we had the operational change plan that happened a couple of years ago. We know that we made $3.2 million in cuts. We know our teachers and our classified staff haven't had uh, significant raises in many years. We're doing what we need to do, but we need the state government to help us as well. So please take a look at my superintendent's report. If you have an inkling to do so, please pick up the phone and call one of our representatives or write them an email or send them a letter because I think collectively we can make some great things happen here in our school district, but it does take everyone working together. So enough from me tonight. I do have some awesome students we want to celebrate. So Mr. Winter is here, and he would like, oh, my, is it going to work? Oh, okay, well, well, let's go up here again. Sorry, Mr. Winter. Here's the um, survey. Switching gears. If you can't be flexible in education, you need to get out. Um, here's the survey. So these are the questions. This is how simple it is. Um, first of all, we're going to ask the parents, um, and a actually, I think some of our high school kids, 
kids might be interested in doing this too. Ask anyone who is interested to fill out a survey who you are and how you're affiliated with our school district. Um, if you have children in our school district, which buildings they attend. Uh, when was the last time you visited one of our buildings? Um, your feeling about whether or not the buildings are maintained well, and if so, and or if not, let us know what, why you feel the way you do. Um, whether or not our facilities meet the uh, academic needs of our children, and please provide some feedback about that, why you think the way you do about your answer. And then um, whether or not you believe our schools are safe. That's a very important question for us to know your answer, your feedback. Please be um, frank with us. And then uh, whether or not you believe that our current district technology is meeting the needs of our 21st century learners. And then um, how we do compare to neighboring school districts, if you want to give us some examples, if you know someone has something that you would like us to look at, or Northfield, um, Nor Nordonia, or any place, if you have an idea of something we're not doing, you'd like us to do with our grounds and facilities, that's the place to let us know. And uh, any other feedback that you have about the, uh, the district, we're interested in learning about that. Again, this is not about programs or people. This is about grounds and facilities, so please be frank. Um, the, the more information we have, good, bad, and otherwise, we can make some good decisions moving forward. Okay, thanks, Jen. All right, and now it's time to celebrate some outstanding students, and we're going to ask Mr. Winter from Samuel Bissell Elementary School to please come forward. And uh, Mr. Stuber is going to help with pins, and Mr. Walker is going to help us too. program at Samuel Bissell Elementary School recognizes outstanding student achievement at the second and third grade levels. The focus of this recognition program is on citizenship, academic, social, civic, volunteer, or other accomplishments that set students apart from their peers. We would like to proudly acknowledge the positive accomplishments of the following students. So we're going to be begin with our second grade children. First of all, from Mrs. Conrad's class, we have Elia Kreko. And then from Mrs. Conrad's class, we have Sarah Miller. Congratulations. From Mrs. Rowetter's class, we have Jessica Moore. And for Mr. Robles' class, we have Beverly Williams. <laughs> Moving on to our big kids in third grade, from Mrs. DePew's class, we have Alex Keefe. And from Mrs. Haas' class, we have Kendall Massey. <laughs> from Ms. Belinsky's class, we have Vani Modi. Thank you, Bissell Students of the Month. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Boys and girls, if you want to turn your certificates forward and hold them up nicely, because I know your parents would like to take a great photo of the whole bunch of you.
One more round of applause for our amazing Bissell students. <laughs> Boys and girls, you may be seated. And I know Mr. Winter would like to uh, make comment this afternoon, or this evening rather, about a staff member of the month from Bissell. So Mr. Winter. Thank you, Mrs. Powers. Good evening, everyone. I um, just want to thank everyone for coming out on this mild 32 degree evening. I think after the uh, February we had, I think anything over 30 is considered gorgeous weather in our neck of the woods. So as Mrs. Powers said, i um, here to um, talk about our staff member of the month. And before I get to that, I just wanted to thank all of our staff members for coming out this evening in support of our students. But um, our staff member of the month happens to be Mrs. Emily DePew. So Ms. DePew, can you come on up, please? So Mrs. DePew is a third grade teacher at Bissell Elementary, and she was nominated for Staff of the Month by our physical education teacher, Mrs. Haynes. And Mrs. Haynes wrote that, I am honored to nominate Emily DePew as Staff of the Month. Emily is a hardworking, energetic teacher who cares deeply about her students. Emily is always willing to step in and help out in any way she can for our school and our staff. She is part of the Social Sunshine and Career Day committees. She and her father stepped in to help pick up boxes of food for those in need during the holidays. Whenever a staff member has a question or needs a hand, Mrs. DePew is there for them. The rapport she maintains with her students is firm and fair. They know she cares for them and wants the absolute best for them and their future. Samuel Bissell is a better place because of Mrs. DePew. Congratulations, Emily. <laughs> Do you want to say a few words? No. Okay, all right, all right, very good. Thanks. <laughs> very humbling. Thank you, Bill. Um, at this time, I would like to call up um, some other students who have come out tonight to share some of the projects they were working on for Black History Month and their teacher, Mrs. Holiday. Come on up, kids, and Mrs. Holiday. Our second grade social studies standard asks the students to show how people's actions have shaped the world that we live in. We also have a standard that asks them to research independently and in a group. So um, as a beginning activity, what we do is we give the kids time to work in pairs and we assign them a famous inventor. We did um, some inventors like Eli Whitney, <coughs> Levi Strauss, Ben Cohen of the famous Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So what they do is they research with their partner, then they present, and then they, pr they uh, research, they practice, and they present about their individual. So then we assign a take-home activity, and what they have to do is they research a famous African-American, and they work with their parents at home, and they make their box, and then they come to school and they present it to the class. So we have four individuals here today who would like to share theirs with you. So we have Haley Benage. Gabby Douglas. Gabrielle Christina Victoria Douglas was born on December 31st, 1995. Early life. When Gabby turned six years old, her mom signed her up for her first gymnastics lessons. She had natural talent. Family life. Gabby grew up in Virginia with her mom, dad, two sisters, and one brother. When she was 14 years old, Gabby moved away from her family to train for the Olympics with Coach Lang Chow. Why the person is famous. At the 2012 Olympic Games, Gabby Douglas became the first ever African-American gymnast to win the gold in the all-around competition. Interesting facts. Gabby is nicknamed the Flying Squirrel. When you unscrabble the letters in Douglas, you get USA Gold. Gabby has two dogs named Zoe and Chandler. 
major accomplishments. When Gabby was eight years old, she became the 2004 Virginia State Champion. At the 2012 Olympic Games, Gabby and the rest of the Fab Five won the team gold. And then we have Hannah Gullinevri. Michelle Obama, First Lady of the United States. To early life, she was born January 17, 1964 in Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. She has one older brother, Craig. Family life. Michelle married Barack Obama. They have two daughters, Natasha and Malaya. They live in the White House. Um, three interesting facts. Um, she eats bacon, eggs, and fruit for breakfast. She and her brother skip second grade. Michelle and her family have one dog named Bo. Uh, she is famous because she is the first lady of the United States. Um, yeah. And we have Randy White. Barack Obama. Barack Obama was born August 4, 1961, in Honolulu, Hawaii. While living with his grandparents, Obama enrolled in the esteemed Hapum Academy, excelling in basketball and graduating in 1979. Barack Obama has been married to Michelle Obama since October 3rd, 1992, and they have two children named Malia and Sasha Obama. Barack Obama became the President of the United States of America. He collected Spider-Man, and Coney the and the Barbarian. His name means who is blessed in Swahili. He is known as the Obama for his skills at basketball. <laughs> Barack Obama is famous because for his main accomplishments that lead him to become the 44th President of the United States of America. And finally, Fox Gansler. Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron was born on February 5th, 1934. He had seven siblings. He was born third. One of his sibling, siblings was Tommy Aaron, who later played in the Major League Baseball. He liked to play baseball and football. Hank Aaron scored 755 home runs. He went to 25 All-Star games, 2,297 RBIs, all records he holds in the Major League Baseball. He played for 23 seasons. His batting average is .305. He earned three gold gloves. Thank you. Boys and girls, you did excellent. Boys and girls, those are excellent projects. And I think that's pretty cool the way you put all that work on a box. Such a unique way of doing that. Yeah, they really enjoyed it. They, and they brought to share them in the class as well. Very nice. Congratulations for a work well done. Thank you. <laughs> All right, one more um, quick announcement before we um, turn it back over to uh, Mrs. Powers and have the um, RBC kids come up. Last um, Friday, um, the Rotary Club here in town came to Bissell and um, did a really great thing for our third grade students. They brought um, 310 dictionaries and donated one to each and every one of our third grade students. And ever since that day, um, I've been walking in and out of classrooms. And um, during their reading time, instead of picking up a novel or a book, they've been reading the dictionary. <laughs> so um, it really has been a cool thing. And so I just wanted to uh, you know, publicly just thank the Rotary Club um, 
for you know coming in and doing that for our students and uh, we certainly appreciate the partnership that we have with you and in fact we have um, some thank you notes that were um, written by some of our students and also um, a class had put this together which we will give to the Rotary Club and just basically just thanking them for um, you know reaching out to us and giving us those dictionaries so um, again just wanted to thank um, the Rotary Club um, you know for coming in and um, you know donating those dictionaries to us we really do appreciate it Thank you, Mr. Winter. I was at uh, Bissell on um, Friday last week when Mr. Seracy came, and Mrs. Seracy was there too, and they delivered the, the dictionaries uh, actually to Mrs. Dorland's third grade students. And it's funny, but um, the kids were so excited about getting those dictionaries, and one little guy came up to me and said, you know, my sister got one of these when she was in third grade, and I was waiting to get mine this year. I'm so glad it's here. So um, I know um, Mrs. Terrell Waldron is a member of our Rotary. Please extend our thanks uh, to the Rotary on behalf of all of our children, especially the third graders, because they love those dictionaries. I'll tell you that. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Reese to come forward. He's the principal at R.B. Chamberlain Middle School, and um, Mr. Stuber is going to come back around, and our middle school students being presented this evening, again, if you would please shake hands with Mr. Stuber, and he has a nice pin for you on behalf of the board. And, of course, Mr. Reese uh, would like to shake your hand, too, and you'll remain standing up front here to all of the middle school students are recognized. So at R.B. Chamberlain Middle School, students of the month receive this honor because they're being recognized for meeting all six of the criteria listed here. Each student has to meet all six criteria in all of these classes as the grade level teams decide upon two boys and two girls to be selected each month from each grade. And the criteria include these students show respect and consideration for others, show enthusiasm for academic and extracurricular activities, exert a positive influence on classmates, exhibit strong leadership characteristics, exhibit patriotism and democratic principles, and show responsibility such as being punctual and having their assignments done on time. So we're very, very proud of the following students of the month from R.B. Chamberlain Middle School. To begin with our seventh graders, we have Deepti Naruka. Dylan Fields. Andre Young. And Angela Muradov. Oh, well, congratulations to you. Thank you. Nicely done. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. On to our eighth grade students. We have Monica Shaw. Cole Turner. Mariah Miles. And Jacob Brooks. Please join me in congratulating these outstanding students of the month from R.B. Chamberlain Middle School. Okay, you want to hold one second so your moms and dads can get a nice photo of the whole group of you? <laughs> That's a great thing. All right, one more round of applause for these outstanding students.
Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we had an, an incredible month at Chamberlain, but I have to admit, Wilcox students, that the highlight for me lately was getting to read to you today at, in uh, your class. And when we were reading the book, we had some hard words we came across, and one of them was calamity. And I asked the kids, anyone know what calamity means? And one little guy raised his hand, and he said, well, that's when something bad happens. And I said, yes, that's good. And I said, you know, when we have a day when we don't have school, that's called a calamity day. And the kids looked at me and said, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, our students at Chamberlain, we did some outstanding things. We competed in the uh, Summit County Spelling Bee. There were 14 other schools there. The top seven from the Summit County Spelling Bee go on to the Regional Bee. And Chamberlain students took first place, fourth place, and sixth place. So that was unbelievable. <laughs> Those students will be competing Saturday, and the winner of that regional B will compete in Washington, D.C. in the National Spelling Bee. So those three uh, will be competing this Saturday. Our uh, English classes wrote for the VFW District Patriots Pen Contest, and a Chamberlain student won our district and went to, uh, it's actually an independence, VFW Patriots Pen. So they hold the state contest in independence. And a Chamberlain student took third place. That was Jonathan Brooks, third place. And he won $800 for his essay, which was great. <laughs> and then our, uh, our Power of the Pen writing team competed in regionals uh, c about a week and a half ago. And uh, they took third in the region. We had a seventh grader who placed first. Our entire seventh grade team qualified for state. So that was some of our highlights from this past uh, month, a great month for uh, Chamberlain Middle School. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. There's always something exciting happening at our middle school. We appreciate you hearing, sharing all that great information and all those wonderful things happening with our middle school students. Uh, Mr. Suver, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Powers. Before we move on to the committee reports, uh, you're all welcome to stay for the rest of the board meeting, but I know some of you would like to go, and if you do want to go, now would be the time to do that. Thank you very much for attending tonight. Okay, and as they are departing, we will move on in the agenda to our communications uh, committee reports. Uh, I'd like to lead off with Mr. Curtis. I know Mark is here tonight with an update from the CVCC. Thank you, and good evening, Twinsburg Board. Um, I have a few uh, student recognitions uh, to go over, and then I have some uh, other uh, things that I can talk about relative to what's, what's happened. Uh, at the CVCC, but first and foremost, uh, students, uh, Twinsburg students um, at the CVCC uh, play, uh, placed first place uh, for the um, Ohio Pro Start uh, Invitational. Mm -hmm. And forgive me if this is a little redundant uh, to kind of what uh, Steve had, had given you before. I'm trying to remember exactly what information mm -hmm. he had given you. So rather than risk not reporting it, 
you know, I wanted to go out with. You Good know. things about the students can be repeated. There you go. go ahead. There you go. There you go. But these these kids were uh, specifically in culinary arts. Now, you know, we get these updates uh, at the board meetings, and so they list all of the kids uh, from all of the districts and and the, and the subjects. And so, I'm looking for all you know the rest of the kids, uh, you know that, um, you know the, uh, that place in culinary arts. All of them were from Twinsburg. So we got first place, uh, and as a result of that, they get to go to Disneyland uh, for the Nationals. Uh, the students are Tessa Ackley, Natasha Daniels, Aaron Sharp, Ian Messner, and Stephanie Tolbert. Now, Natasha Daniels uh, did well enough to where she got an additional $6,000 scholarship award for outstanding leadership. So I thought that was pretty impressive, and I think I met her uh, uh, um, as well. So pretty impressive young lady. And uh, they're going to be going down to Disneyland um, uh, for the Nationals. The other uh, recognition uh, for students who participated in the Business Professionals of America Regional Conference. And these students are as follows. Chaz Lewis, Dominic Salvaggio, Courtney Blaha, Tiffany Ivey, Matthew Faulkner, Elam Kumahar, James Banham, and Raymond Gines. Uh, the other competition was the national, it's actually not a competition, but we had a number of students who were recognized uh, uh, through the uh, National Techni Technical Honor Society. Uh, they were inductees uh, in the National Technical Honor Society. And they are uh, Marissa uh, Depenti, uh, uh, Jacob Roth, uh, Rebecca Saidhu, and Mercedes White. Uh, also, with respect to uh, the culinary piece, the uh, CVCC culinary management team uh, also placed uh, first in the Pro Start Invitational Competition. Uh, they'll be going as well, and the Ohio Restaurant Association has donated $3,000 uh, to the center to help defray the cost of the trip. So we thought that that was very nice uh, of them to do so. So those are the student recognitions that we have. And I also just kind of wanted to run down a couple of things uh, that are going on at the center. Um, last month, uh, I had the opportunity to attend the 35th annual uh, ACTE Legislative Seminar, and that's down in Columbus, um, where you know we have an opportunity to um, uh, uh, interact uh, with other uh, leaders uh, in career and technical education. Almost 300 career uh, centers actually were, were represented, and legislators uh, were there to uh, present and give us updates uh, on what's going on in the world of career and technical education. Uh, and also throughout that time, it's kind of a day and a half process. The second day that I was there, I actually had a chance to uh, meet with the aides of uh, Slabby and uh, LaRose. We, was, uh, we were trying to get, get a meeting with Rogner, but she wasn't available to do that. So um, I know that you're very active in terms of um, communicating your concerns uh, to the state legislature. I was down there specifically for matters relative to career and technical education, um, but I was also, I was able to, you know, raise some things relative to what we would like to see, especially some ask for, uh, 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 for the current, uh, uh, the proposed budget as well. So it's looking like we might get some things uh, that we're asking for, but it was really beneficial to have the, have the opportunity to go down there uh, and meet, the, uh, meet with the aides uh, in the state house. Uh, the 24th, uh, uh, which is what, last week, uh, Twinsburg Chamber of Commerce, uh, we had a, a luncheon uh, that was featured uh, at, uh, at the CBC. I know Rob was there, uh, as well as the superintendent, uh, and they did a presentation, another presentation on the Ramtech Center, um, and I had an opportunity to kind of uh, engage with some folks from the chamber, uh, never had an opportunity to do that, so that was great, uh, and they focused uh, as I said, they did some focus on the Ram Tech Center and the highlights, uh, and they were also able to take a tour of where it's going to be, as well as the current facility that we have uh, that it will help augment uh, our current offerings. I was also interviewed uh, by Channel 9 um, as well, so stay tuned, check <laughs> it out. Um, you know, on kind of my perspective uh, of, 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 of how we got the straight A grant uh, and also how students <coughs> in Twinsburg can benefit from going to the CVCC. So uh, Steve was also interviewed. He blew me out of the water because that's his thing. <laughs> uh, but I think I held my own also. Uh, coming up is Division 8 meeting uh, with Twinsburg. And I think it's going to be held at uh, uh, Kent State. 
again like it was last year, so I'm looking forward to that. I know that uh, the mayor's office as well as the Chamber of Commerce is representative at that meeting. I'm not sure if they're going to be at that uh, on the 11th, but I'm looking forward to that as well. Hopefully I'll be able to report out um, in more detail uh, um, at the conclusion of that meeting. And also mark your calendars if you haven't already received an invitation, I'll ensure that you do. Uh, at the end of this month, uh, March 31st, the RAM Tech groundbreaking uh, will be taking place at the CVCC. It's going to be at 11 o'clock in the morning, and then following uh, the ceremony, there's going to be a luncheon uh, open to the district's uh, eight chambers of commerce. Uh, we're expecting uh, over 200 people uh, to come. We've also invited uh, our representative uh, in Columbus, as well as the governor. Um, and a few other important people. So we're looking forward to that. And we are projecting that January 2016 will be the grand opening. That's what we're planning. So hopefully if everything goes as planned, you know, we'll have a new center uh, opening in January 2016. That concludes my report. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for your Thank time. Other committee reports tonight. Come to my right. Yeah, I think she's asked you enough. Yeah. Um, starting with athletics, just wanted to mention that next Friday, March 13th, they will be doing the um, DARE game, and that is a game between some of the teachers and coaches and things like that, as well as our, I believe, firemen and policemen. So that's next Friday. Also during that time, the Clinsburg Athletic Boosters will be doing their Hall of Fame induction. And that's um, something that we do every year and very nice presentation. And the people that are going to be getting into the Hall of Fame are Brian Miller, Dan Grummet, Lauren Maser, Ryan Selman, John Curry, Jim DeSico, and Brad Stuber. So they'll be as I said, getting inducted next Friday. So I highly encourage you all to attend that. Um, I also wanted to make mention um, as far as buildings and grounds, just recognizing with all the snow and um, the ice, I wanted to just say our crews have been doing an amazing job. Um, I have three kids in the district as well, and when I go to the different schools or having to go in and out, um, the sidewalks are always clear, they're salted. Um, they do an amazing job. So I just wanted to give them a little shout out and say thank you for all your hard work because I know they have been working very hard. Um, back to athletics, um, for RBC, the seventh and eighth grade girls basketball teams have had successful seasons. The eighth grade team coached by Todd Kalkbrenner had a 10 and four overall record and are the number two seed in the upper bracket of the NOC tournament being held this weekend at Shaker Middle School. The seventh grade girls basketball team coached by John Mattoon had a seven and seven overall record and are the top seed in their bracket of the seventh grade NLC tournament, which will be held at Southeast Lid Middle School this week. The girls have worked hard throughout the season and, ha and have shown great deal of improvement from the start to the finish. Best of luck to both teams in their tournament games this week and a huge thanks to our great coaches for all the time, effort and energy they've shown this season. Also, um, a thank you to the parents for supporting our athletes. Um, we know without the parents, you know, the kids can't get back and forth to practice and things, so thank you as well. The spring sports at RBC um, are getting to a kickoff. Softball tryouts will be on Monday, March 9th, and they will go through Wednesday, March 11th. Baseball tryouts will begin on Thursday, March 12th, and go through Monday, March 16th. All students interested in either of these sports are encouraged to try out. Track season is also scheduled to start this Monday, but most likely will be delayed because of snow. <laughs> any parents, <laughs> obviously, um, any parents or students with questions about getting involved in these sports can contact Mr. Fantone at RBC. Also a shout out to um, Brian Fantone. He does a great job down at RBC um, with our middle school kids. So thank you, Brian, for all your hard work. And then for high school athletics, the spring sports are just getting underway, um, also waiting for the snow to melt. Coach Mike Bell conducted his first meeting with our football parents last week, and by all accounts, it was a very positive and, enthusi and enthusiastic meeting. 
everyone associated with the program seems excited and ready to get started. The girls basketball, they have reached the Ohio High School Athletic Association district final and will play Shaw tomorrow evening at seven o'clock at Euclid High School. Um, Julie Solis does a great job with our girls basketball team. So if you're available tomorrow evening, Euclid High School, seven o'clock. Our boys basketball begins their o OHSA sectional playoff tonight at Cleveland Heights High School. Girls bowling, they concluded their season by finishing seventh at the district. Um, it was another great season for our ladies and the top five in each state championship tournament. Um, top five make it to the state tournament. In swimming and diving, we, um, they had a tremendous season. None of our swimmers qualified to the Ohio High School Championship meet. Uh, however, Maddie Pops did qualify for the state championship and they were held last Thursday in Canton. This was um, a very significant achievement on its own, but to make the even more special, this is Maddie's first ever season as a diver. And she, um, she's been a gymnast for life, I know that. She's um, an amazing gymnast and obviously an amazing diver. So kudos to Madison um, for doing an amazing job in representing PHS. In wrestling, team finished seventh at the Ohio High School sectional meet last week in Austintown. Although the team did not advance further, Trevor Bruce, Noah Edwards, Luke DiMuzio, Eric Murdoch, and Timmy Edwards all qualified to the OHSAA district tournaments this weekend at Menor High School. And we wish them good luck at the districts and hope they make it through the, to the state finals. Our cheerleading team um, enjoyed another tremendous season as they finished 13th in the state of Ohio at the OHSSA championships at St. John Arena in Columbus last Sunday. And as always, we're very proud of this group. And I also wanted to do a shout out to the Twinsburg Athletic Boosters who provided transportation for them down to the state tournament. They got them um, coach buses and so they were able to travel down there in, in comfort, um, not on the school bus. And as mentioned, the girls did a very good job. And that is all I have for after. Thank you. That's it for committee reports. We move now to administrative reports. And I think, Mrs. Powers, I'll let you do the introduction here because I know we're going to talk it right back over to the other side. Thank you, Mrs. Hoover. Um, recently, the uh, State Auditor's Office uh, met with Mr. Aho and myself and, and Mr. Hoover and Mr. Felber and Mr. Welker uh, to uh, summarize the audit uh, of last fiscal year and uh, had a great result. And this evening, um, Mr. Aho would like to present to you an overview of the audit and the great news that the uh, report brought to our school district. So, with distinction, Mr. Marty Aho. Thank you, Mrs. Powers. Um, the auditors were there. Um, they do the audit. They come in. Um, we end our school year. We're on a fiscal school year, so it ends June 30th. Um, so they come in shortly after that, and they start looking at our books. They um, um, look through what we have, and then they, and they do their audit. Um, this is what the audit um, report looks like. Every year we have a new cover. Um, it kind of uses the uh, um, district calendar as our, as our template. Um, but if you wanted to see a copy of the audit, which is many pages long, you can get it off of our website. Um, click on the, the treasurer's page on the you know the district department's treasurer's page, um, and then you can find the audit. It'll take you down to the um, auditor of state's website. Um, the audit process, and this is kind of what they do. Um, these are this is some of the verbiage they use when they give us their audit opinion. Um, there's several um, different letters that they give us, but um, uh, when they go through the audit, they, they look for certain things. Um, part of the audit is they uh, um, perform their audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States and a controller general of the United States government's auditing standards. Um, they look at all the major funds, they look at our federal funds, they look at you know all the different things that we have, all the, um, the PI fund, debt, debt service funds, and, and they look at all that stuff and just make sure everything um, is appropriate. Um, as part of the financial audit, the auditors consider the district's um, internal control over financial reporting. So um, they do some <laughs> testing of internal controls, they see how those are. Um, they don't really give an opinion on the internal controls, but they do test them and they look at them. Um, 
part of when they're doing an audit, they look at the, the structure of the district. Um, you know, they call it tone at the top. Um, do the um, top administrators, um, you know, have, have value with w what the internal control process is? Um, or do they just dismiss it? Well, I mean, we're pretty in, in, intense on making sure that internal controls are followed. Um, and so that's one of the things that the auditors look at. Um, moving further on, as part of the reasonable assurance with the auditors, um, whether the financial statements are free from material um, misstatements, um, they look at compliance. Um, and that's one of the things that probably the state auditors do more so is, is their compliance testing. They have an actual compliance manual that they go through with all the Ohio revised code sections in there that are important to auditing a school district. Um, they go through those steps. Um, a lot of it has to do with budgetary, the proper following of the procedures, um, um, you know, the, pur the purchase order process where you have to do our appropriations. A lot of that you, he you, you hear at the board meetings where we're, we're doing our budget, um, you know, the, the, the budget meeting at the beginning of the year in January, and then we're doing other things along the way. And the, <coughs> the final appropriations, you know, then are in September. Um, all that's part of the budgetary process, and that's one of the things that they test. Um, they look to make sure that we're following other standards, um, depository agreements with banks. That, you know, all that, a lot of the things they just want to see that you're thinking about it, putting it in writing, and, and just following the revised code. Um, a lot of the stuff in the revised code really is there because somewhere along the line somebody didn't do something, and um, now they codified it all just to make sure that you follow those rules and guidelines. And then the other s final bullet point is when they audit the finance statements. Um, this is basically in their opinion statement. Um, says, you know, talking as the auditor of the state's office, we have audited the financial statements of the government's activities, each major fund and the aggregate remaining funds, information of the Twinsburg City School District as of the year end of June 30th, um, and the resulting notes of the financial statements. So they look at all the stuff. Um, and then basically they say at the end then, we've issued our unmodified report thereon dated December 23rd. Um, so an unmodified report is a good thing. Th those are the reports where um, they have no exceptions, there's nothing noted, so it's a clean audit, and that's basically what they're saying there. After the audit was released, um, we had a nice little write-up. Um, Andy Shunk from the bulletin called and, and did a nice little write-up for us. Um, so this is in the bulletin. Um, a clean financial audit for Twinsburg City Schools District. Um, he goes on there and he goes, taxpayers expect, um, this is from uh, the auditor's David Yost's um, comments that he made. Um, taxpayers expect accurate financial records from their local school district. Um, Ohio Auditor of State David Yost said January 22nd with the release of the audit. Um, Twinsburg City Schools um, District's dedication to accountability is evident. Um, so that was, that was a nice little comment there. Um, one of the things they noted too, then according to the audit, no issues of material or significant weaknesses were found in the district's financial record keeping over the past year. Um, and then, of course, Mr. Stuver, they had reviewed Mr. Stuver, and he said, we're very pleased with how the audit turned out. So this was in the Twinsburg Bulletin. Um, then Auditor Yost um, gave us our uh, award uh, that we talked about earlier tonight. Um, the state award with distinction is given to those entities that file an annual CAPR, which is our comprehensive annual financial statement, um, in a timely financial reports according to GAAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles, as well as receiving a clean audit. Um, clean audit means that the financial audit didn't contain any findings for recovery, material citations, weaknesses, deficiencies, um, single audit findings, no question costs. Um, clean and accurate record keeping are the foundation of good government and taxpayers can take pride in your commitment to accountability. And that's um, from David Yost, the Auditor of State. Um, one of the things also too, and then when they're talking about the single audit there, that's part of the um, audit process where the auditors look at the federal funds. Um, there's a lot of strings attached to federal money. You have to, you know, when you receive federal money, it has to be used for a specific purpose. Um, so we have to make sure that we follow that. There's, and there's all kind of um, tie-ins to that. There's maintenance of effort, there's supplanting, and there's all these other um, things that they have that you have to follow when you receive federal money, which is really pretty strict. Um, and the other day, January 25th, Auditor Yost did come by the office and, and present us with our award. Um, it was very nice of him to come by. Um, 
Do we have to go outside and get a nice picture? I guess so. <laughs> Just, uh, you can hold it up. But this would yeah. be a good time to hold it up. <laughs> here's the, here's the, um, the award that he presented. There's Nancy Wagner, Donna Kelly, John Tramartino, myself, and, and Andre Yost. So it was very nice. And also, too, part of our audits, um, we receive our GFOA um, Certificate of Achievement and fin Excellence in Financial Reporting. Um, this is the one from last year. We just submitted the report, so it takes uh, about a month or two to get back the, um, cer the certificate. Uh, we'd expect that we'll get another one this year um, because of the clean audit. Um, the GFOA then is, um, looks to see you know, that we do follow the procedures. Um, so they give us this certificate, and then they also um, you know, give us a, a, a release there that, um, on the um, information. Um, and basically, it says the same thing. You know, the, 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 the commitment to financial reporting and, and accurate financial reporting is, is important. Um, that's kind of it. The audit, you know, it entails a lot of detail rep um, that the auditors do. They go through the records and that. Um, so they didn't find anything, and that's a good thing. Um, and we're pretty proud of that. It takes a lot of hard work from building level secretaries all the way up through you know, central office staff. Um, there's a lot of people keeping their eye on what's going on, making sure they follow um, the proper procedures. So that's all I have. You know, yes. Mr. Ayo, I know we spend a lot of time um, talking about educational things and we have the students up here and we do Students of the Month. Well, in kind of a, a geeky financial way, this is Treasurer of the Month yeah. or something like that. You know, we, we do spend a lot of time where it's appropriate on the, on the academics, but behind the scenes there's so much going on, you know, the, the support staff, the teachers, the administrators, and the financial officers. It's one of those places that you can overlook when things are going well, you kind of overlook it. Um, we don't overlook it because we're constantly looking over your shoulder, which is what our, our job is, but we want to say thank you very much for you and your team and all that they do and, and everybody that's involved. So thanks, Mike. Anything else? Oh, Mrs. Powers, anything else in the administrative report? Not this evening, thank you. Very good, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is remonstrance. And as a reminder, the purpose of the regular meetings of the Board of Education is to conduct business. And because the Board of Education represents a school district, which is a public organization, these business meetings are required to be conducted in public. These regular business meetings are different from community forums or other special meetings, which are conducted with the specific intent to engage with or encourage interactive discussion with the community. To accommodate public participation as part of the regular business meetings, an agenda item referred to as remonstrance is included. The conduct for remonstrance is provided for within the Board of Education bylaws, specifically section 0169. Persons wishing to speak during remonstrance are asked to provide your name, address, and group affiliation, if any. Comment should be limited to five minutes, and the total time for public participation is limited to 30 minutes. While statements regarding matters of general district policy or procedure are, are appropriate, statements should not be personally directed nor abusive, nor should statements be made regarding specific disciplinary matters involving students or staff. To address concerns regarding student disciplinary matters or staff performance, the board requests that you submit such concerns in writing to the superintendent. And at this time, I would like to conduct the remonstrance. And as is our uh, practice, we have the blue cards that people fill out. And Mr. Dearson, you, uh, you got overlooked last time because we went ran late and uh, you couldn't stay late. So I'm gonna have you step up first and the mic is yours, sir. Good evening. My name is Ray Dearson. I live at 3500 Cannon Road. I've been a resident of Twinsburg about 70 years. <coughs> uh, my wife and I would like to thank you for Blackboard Connect. Uh, we really appreciate being notified not only when school closings or delayed start times, but also when some buses are running late due to breakdown or accident. This information is a great benefit. We, we really appreciate it, thank you. Uh, we have six grandchildren attending Twinsburg schools at present. Our youngest started this year. I went to the Wilcox office 
to find out the procedure so I can have lunch with her. I was told grandparents can have lunch. Only a parent or guardian can, and only once a year for the birthday. I asked why. I was told it was board policy. Our first five grandchildren, I went and had lunch with each of them throughout the year. I would ask each one first if I can come and have lunch with them. They would tell me what day to come because of their favorite menu item. When I did not come for a while, they asked me when I was coming to have lunch with them again. Their mother, of course, would send a note uh, at a time. Your policy to allow a parent to have one lunch with a child a year for only a birthday is very sad. But not only to allow a grandparent at all, I, like other parents and grandparents, want to make as many happy memories as we can for our kids as well as for ourselves. You have all the rules and procedures in place to allow parents or grandparents to have lunch. Please change your policy and allow a parent or grandparent the privilege of having a lunch with them. Though this little gesture would benefit the student as well as the grandparent or parent. Please allow us the privilege of spending a few brief moments of having lunch and creating a lifelong memory, even if it's only once a month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Um, duly noted, the policy committee will put that on their agenda and take a look at it. Uh, next, uh, we have three cards regarding uh, Common Core and Park, and uh, ladies have organized themselves. There's numbers on them, so I'd ask uh, Ms. Karen Turner to come on up. Good evening. My name is Karen Turner. I live at 2677 Bronson's Way. I have two children in the Twinsburg schools, one in seventh grade and one in fifth. I first heard about Common Core from my daughter's teacher a couple years ago. I volunteered in the classroom every week, and we had many conversations during those times. I also attended every presentation Twinsburg schools put on regarding Common Core and park testing. There was going to be a shift in education, a new focus on pathways to college and career readiness, to what have been identified as 21st century skills, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, communication, and creativity and innovation. The bar was going to be raised. Sign me up, I thought, just what I want for my children. I assumed, of course, that these standards had been thoroughly researched. They had been created by educators, sufficiently piloted, and were developmentally appropriate. Shame on me for being so naive and trusting. The standards were published on June 2nd, 2010, and adopted on June 7th, 2010. Five days, including a weekend, to overhaul Ohio's education system. There were 15 total resources used for creating the mathematics standards. I have looked through more than 15 resources for my five-minute speech tonight. Of the 101 individuals developing the math and ELA standards, only five were teachers. Yet, there was a very large representation of people from the testing companies. Dr. James Milgram, a Common Core Validation Committee member, testified on the math standards. I quote, the Common Core standards claim to be benchmarked against the international standards, but this phrase is meaningless. They are actually two or more years behind international expectations by eighth grade and only fall further behind as they talk about grades eight through 12, end quote. Common Core standards put high emphasis on critical thinking and abstract ideas at a young a younger age when children don't have the developed brain function to do it. It's like working with a three-month-old, trying to get them to walk. They don't have the skills, they're not developed enough to succeed. 
On the other hand, math standards have been lowered and omit high school mathematics standards leading to a STEM career. My son Aiden has been interested in anything STEM since preschool. You all met him in January when he presented with his first Lego League team at your board meeting. A few years ago, he told us he wanted to go to MIT. We said, if you get into MIT, we will find a way to pay for it. I do not want to go back to my son and say, I'm sorry, you didn't get an education that qualified you to go to MIT, but we can get you into the local community college. On to the park. I know Ms. Powers and the board support reducing the hours of state mandating test mandated testing. 42 hours of state testing for my son and 33 hours for my daughter, added to the countless hours of preparation for testing, has taken a significant chunk out of my children's daily opportunity to learn. Unfortunately, there are more issues with the park than just the hours the test and prep take away from valuable instruction time. The results will not come back until the following school year, rendering any information from it useless. By the way, I'm still waiting on my daughter's pilot test results that were taken last school year. The tests are expensive to administer and will probably increase with the number of states now backing out. Let's not forget the infrastructure getting into place for data mining. I also challenge you to take a few of the sample exams and see how well you perform. I am all for standards, assessments, and accountability, as long as they are appropriate. I know as a school board, you are unable to repeal Common Core standards or stop park testing. So what am I asking for? For you to support your parents, provide honest communication that has clear, non-conflicting facts about our options and rights. Educate yourselves by doing your own research and attend one of the presentations that you have been invited to. The next one is on March 19th. Support your teachers. There are other ways besides high stakes testing to hold teachers accountable. Above all, support your students. Take a stand, much like your recent resolution you passed on state testing hours. Give our children the best opportunities to learn, not only how to score well on a test, but in all areas of education. Thank you. Next, I have a card uh, for Miss Carrie Bush. Hello, my name is Carrie Bush. I live at 2110 Cameron Road uh, with my husband, Chris, and we have two daughters, Brittany is 14, and Taya is 8. Um, we both are, we have lived in Clintsburg for 16 years. I'm here to share with you my concerns and feelings for Common Core. I withdrew our children from our district and began homeschooling them, and it's 100% because of Common Core. I oppose the Common Core state standard and the standardized testing, testing for two reasons. One, they are developmentally inappropriate. And two, there is no proof that the curriculum, curriculum and testing will make our children college and career ready and successful global workers. So why do I say that's developmentally inappropriate? I am a certified occupational therapy assistant with 16 years of experience doing therapy on new, newborn all the way to my oldest patient being 103. My job allows me to work in varied settings, including schools with children. To be a good therapist, I have to know the different developmental processes 
that occur in children and what age grade the developmental milestones typically occur. Jean Shaw, she was an early education, childhood education theorist. She documents stages for reading and development. She reports that in stage one, initial reading and decoding occurs. This is in grades one and two, ages six and seven. Uh, it says child learns relations between letters and sounds and between printed and spoken words. Child is able to read simple text containing high frequency words and phonetically regular words using skill to sound out new one new one syllable words. The common core state standards require first graders to write an opinion piece in which they in introduce the topic, state an opinion, supply a reason for the opinion, and provide some sense of closure. What? How can a first grader complete this? Typical first graders are just beginning to write and complete sentences. They have a very limited spelling ability and a short attention span. This is a four-part problem. First graders would not be able to read this, let alone be, begin to complete it. Therefore, they would fail the assessment or test. So many of the assessments and tests are this inappropriate. So as our children go through school day, day by day being defeated, behaviors begin to emerge. These behaviors include tears of frustration, irritability, stomach aches, and increase in physical complaints. This happened to us last year. My oldest became a clam and she would not open. My youngest would cower in her chair or run and hide when homework was mentioned. When reading, her face would turn red, her breathing increased, and tears came. She was frustrated and trying so hard. I recognized before Christmas how inappropriate the math was as well. Her behaviors increased. And as she began to tell us, she didn't like school. When asked, when we asked why, the answer was always too many papers, no fun. She never once complained of her teachers, and I'm not complaining about our teachers. Like you, they have no choice but to teach what the state has dictated. Standards are needed. The key is to make them developmentally appropriate. There is so much pressure to make our children to be college and career ready and to be internationally competitive for the workforce that appropriate child development is lost. The Common Core State Standards website, Ohio Department of Education's website, and even our own school district website doesn't say anything about child development milestones. Our children have become lost and replaced with testing, assessments, professional development, college and career readiness, rigor, and the international benchmarks that children must meet. This is what education is about now. This is why I homeschool. No matter how fast the world is developing, child development occurs at its own pace. It cannot be wrong. If we don't stand up for our children, the negative effects will be devastating to our future. I'm asking you to join us parents that are concerned in bringing, to bring local control back. Make our schools better than Common Core. Our daughters are very happy and we are using curriculum that has over a, has a, over a 40 year track record, record of student success and it's del developmentally appropriate, challenging, but appropriate. Thank you for hearing my concerns and listening to my experience. I will be happy to work with you on this issue.
My name is Lisa Snow, and I live at 3067 Collingwood Lane in Kingsburg. Uh, my husband Brian and I have three children, uh, two of which are in the Prince Rupert School System, uh, both currently at Dodge. As you know, there is a growing group of parents in the district that are concerned with the implementation of Common Core and the associated assessments in the state of Ohio. While we recognize that this is a statewide issue and not a Prinsburg issue, there is a core group of parents in Prinsburg that have been taking it upon themselves to research the issue deeply and share findings amongst themselves. We have actively sought out state and federal representation to share our concerns, and we felt it would be beneficial to provide a status update to the board and share what we have learned in the past 30 days. First of all, there has been a lot of activity around some very important legislation around Common Core and the assessments being implemented. Uh, Mr. Stuber already talked this evening about HB7 and HB47, so I won't take time to cover those again. However, there are a couple of others I wanted to talk about. Uh, HR5 was introduced and was set to be fast-tracked to get passed this month. Uh, under this great uh, marketing umbrella of what would empower parents, um, embedded in this 611-page text of legislation were many things that many parents uh, found concerning. Uh, I'm just going to name a few. Uh, the Federal Department of Education would aim to take over state authorities and rights. It would also um, take over parental rights to direct the education of our children. And it would enforce the use of Common Core assessment platforms to private education institutions. In other words, if parents decided that the standards and assessments did not work for their children and they would choose to leave public school, it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't have a choice. This stalled in the House Committee this past Friday. Uh, Many believe it's because of the outcry of parents across this country um, in regard to that. And also, speaking with Dave Joyce's office, um, they really felt that they didn't have the vote. But it, that uh, it is being reworked with possible amendments, and it could come back to the floor. Uh, we encourage you to contact Mr. Joyce's office and encourage him to vote no on this if this does come back. While most of the House was above with H.R. 5, uh, there was also S.227, or SIRTA, was being introduced with the hope of being quietly passed without debate. This bill reauthorizes ESRA, the Education Science Reform Act, which was first passed in 2002, which facilitates intrusive data collection on students. Um, and it, it is 100% dependent on FERPA, uh, the FERPA changes that happened that were mentioned at uh, last month's meeting. Um, ESRA began the idea of state longitudinal databases, which created the structure that would uh, facilitate a de facto national student database. Um, ESRA also eliminated previous penalties for sharing and otherwise misusing student data. CERTA also allows for psychological profiling of our children. Um, and if you see section 132, page 28, and I quote, uh, it may include research on social and emotional learning and the acquisition of competencies and skills, including the ability to think critically, solve complex problems, evaluate evidence, and communicate effectively. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about privacy concerns. I bring this up because this is just one of many that parents have, and it's something that is currently in legislation. Um, this bill also um, did stall, um, but again, I bring it up because these are things that, that are in play and, and, and currently in legislation. Um, outside of legislation activity um, that affects Ohio and Flinsburg directly, it's important to note what is happening around our country right now in Common Core. In the last 30 days, West Virginia House voted 75 to 19 to repeal Common Core. Um, some interesting things are happening in New Jersey. Uh, Governor Christie, who has been a staunch supporter of Common Core, is starting to drop hints that he possibly might be changing his stance, which could have a lot to do with his 2016 uh, presidential hopeful, because, because he is a hopeful, um, and also possibly because there um, is legislation going through to uh, have him sign for park testing to be stalled for three years. This just happened on February 27th. Uh, Arizona House voted to ditch the Common Core standards on February 28th. Legislation to block imp implementations of the standard passed the Senate in New Hampshire just this week. And last week, the Common Core standards were found to be unconstitutional by a Missouri judge who voiced the state's membership to a testing company aligned with the National Common Core Education Standards is illegal and that it shouldn't pay fees to be a part of that group. Uh, this le um, level of legislation activity is not indicative to just our community, um, and there are obviously viable concerns across our country in regard to Common Core um, and these assessments. On a separate topic, this core group of concerned parents have had several phone conversations, email correspondences, and face-to-face -face meetings with the following officials, um, Frank, Frank LaRose, David Joyce, Nick Stefani, and Christina Rogner. 
It is our impression that our officials are hearing the same unease from several districts and as parents, uh, some of them as parents shared our concerns. We as a group intend to continue to pursue what is best and right for our children and we'll be working through our representation and educational advocacy groups to persuade the ODE to concretely address our concerns with facts and data. Meanwhile, we ask you as our board to continue to support us as parents. We have um, all the same goal, it's for a generation of happy, creative, productive children that are given the opportunity to learn and explore in school as individuals. Uh, I'd like to give you a quote from Christina Rogner when we met with her the other day. When we asked her her stance on Common Core, she said, I don't want kids in Ohio to be common. I want them to be exceptional. On a personal note, I will add that I have never stood up and advocated for a cause before now. It just affects our children and their futures. And for them, I will not be quiet. As their parents, their administrators, and teachers were all they have left and their only voice. If we don't advocate for them, then who will? Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you to those who spoke tonight again as last time. I appreciate that there are opinions being voiced and that we're able to do so in a respectful and cordial manner. So thank you for doing so tonight. Um, we do have business to conduct, so I would like to move forward in the agenda. Next on our list under agenda item H, under the treasurer's report, we have one item this evening. Item H1, that the Board of Education approves the following meeting minutes from the regular meeting February 18, 2015, which was sent to the, un to the board under separate cover. Is there a motion for this one agenda item, please? Moved. Moved by Ms. Davis, a second? Second by Mr. Waldron. Any comments or discussion on this item? Roll call, please. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Stroh Waldron? Yes. Mrs. Kane Criswell? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. Mr. Stuver? Yes. That item passes by though. Next under the agenda under personnel, we have three items. Without objection, I will read these together consent agenda. Item I-1, that the Board of Education accepts the certificated licensed personnel and or contract recommendations detailed in the attached exhibit I-1 as per the dates, terms, and other applicable conditions specified pending satisfactory OSC background check. Item I-2, that the Board of Education accepts the classified personnel and or contract recommendations detailed in the attached exhibit I-2 as per the dates, terms, and other applicable conditions specified pending satisfactory OSC background checks. And item I-3, that the Board of Education accepts the supplemental contract recommendations which are detailed in the attached <laughs> exhibit I-3 as per the dates, terms, and other applicable conditions specified pending satisfactory ORC background checks. Is there a motion, a motion for these three agenda items, please? Moved. Moved by Mr. Felber, a second? Second by Ms. King Criswell. Uh, one note that I have here for item I-2 is just to highlight the retirement of our assistant treasurer, Nancy Wagner, who has been with the district for 19 years. So uh, she gets mentioned several times tonight, and we uh, want to say thank you for her years of service. Uh, Mr. Aho, anything that you'd like to add? Um, yeah, we hate to see her go. Wish we'd stay a little bit longer, but we understand. <laughs> Everybody has to move on. It'll, it's tough. Okay. Any other comments? Ms. Price? Yes, actually, uh, Mr. Stuber, I'd like to uh, just point to the fact that I'm recommending this evening Tracy Abbott as the Assistant Transportation Supervisor over in our Transportation Department. Um, thanks to um, your approving my request to allow us to uh, kind of shuffle the deck over at Transportation with uh, Mrs. Hurst retirement in December. We know that currently we are being um, Fortunately, helped by Mr. Nick Valentine, who's been our interim supervisor for many months, and he's with us through the middle of April when Mr. Brunton, who you met previously, will be coming on board. But uh, we are also um, recommending this evening Tracy Abbott as our assistant transportation supervisor, and many of our families would say that Tracy runs transportation, because she really does. Um, currently, she is our dispatcher and has done just a phenomenal job and is now stepping into the role of being an administrator. So we congratulate Tracy. Um, we know she's the uh, perfect fit for this new role in transportation, 
And then with that, you see that um, I'm also recommending that Bonnie Day Dean become the new dispatcher. She will replace Tracy. And uh, Bonnie is currently the Secretary of Transportation. That position will uh, be eliminated. And uh, Bonnie then becomes the, the, uh, the dispatcher. And then the department will run without this secretary because really the dispatcher does that uh, role anyhow. So uh, thank you for allowing us to shuffle the deck. I think this is going to be a great um, rejuvenating move down in transportation. And uh, as I said, Mr. Valentine's doing a great job. And Mr. Uh, Brunton, who was with us uh, this week in our interviews of the assistant transportation supervisor position, um, will fit very well in the department. And I think he and Tracy are going to make a great team. Thank you. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Felber? Yes. Mrs. Kane Criswell? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Terrell Waldron? Yes. Mr. Stuber? Yes. And those three motions pass 5 0. Next on our agenda under I, we have nine items that we will act on together and then. Page four of the agenda, I believe that item should be labeled number 10. We'll act on the resolution, which is agenda item J10. That should be J10. We'll act on that separately. Item J1, that the Board of Education donates $1,500 from the Board Services Fund to the Twinsburg High School After Prom Committee. J2, that the Board of Education accepts a donation from Target in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Take Charge of Education program to Samuel Bissell Elementary School in the amount of $229.71 to be used for educational building supply. Item J3, that the Board of Education accepts a donation from the River Valley Paper Company of Akron, Ohio to Samuel Bissell Elementary School in the amount of $70.90 to be used to support student council activities. Item J4, that the Board of Education accepts a donation from Box Tops for Education of Highland Park, Michigan to the Samuel Bissell Elementary School in the amount of $1,820.50 to be used to support student council activities and for school supplies. Item J5, that the Board of Education accepts a donation from Ripco Studio of Cleveland, Ohio to the Samuel Bissell Elementary School in the amount of $1,799.31 to be used for school supplies. Item J6, that the Board of Education wishes, wishes to participate and authorizes the Ohio Schools Council to advertise and receive bids on behalf of said board as per the specifications submitted for the cooperative purchase of waste and recycling services for the period of July 1, 2015 to Ju June 30th, 2018, it is understood there is no fee to participate in this Ohio Schools Council 2015-2018 Waste and Recycle Program. Uh, this was sent to the board under separate coverage. J7, that the Board of Education wishes to participate and authorizes the Ohio Schools Council to advertise and receive bids on behalf of said board as per the specifications submitted for the cooperative purchase of four 72 passenger unitized conventional school bus chassis and bodies. This board agrees to pay $325 to the Ohio Schools Council for the school district's membership as a service fee for, the, for this purpose. That was sent to the board under separate cover. Item J8, that the Board of Education approves the revised central office salary schedule as per the attached exhibit, which is J8. And finally, J9, that the Board of Education approves the revised job description for the payroll officer for the attached exhibit J9. Is there a motion for these nine agenda items, please? Yeah. Moved by Ms. Kane Criswell, a second? Second. Second by Ms. Davis. Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, J6 and 7, these are uh, examples of uh, the district combining resources with other districts and belonging to the Ohio Schools Council to leverage uh, the, the greater good of all of these districts when it comes to purchasing services. So J6 is regarding recycling services and then J7, we do this uh, annually where we connect with the Ohio Schools Council and we use them to conduct the bid process for uh, our renewal and repur or not repurchase, purchase of new buses. So 
uh, you know, $325 to belong to this particular program to the Ohio Schools Council, and we'll save thousands by bidding the school buses through that process. Administrators, I don't know if you want to add any more if I've said enough. Good enough? Perfect. All right, great. Um, and then, uh, Mrs. Powers, if you could just remind the board, J8 and 9, I know we've talked about it, but um, I think I'll have you do better justice by explaining what we've done with the central, uh, what the salary schedule here. Right, it was just uh, as a matter of uh, housekeeping, now that uh, Mrs. Wagner is retiring, we recognize that with the headings at the top, we're not accurate. In fact, when Mr. Manley retired at the end of June, we should have updated the salary schedule. So this new salary schedule, the numbers haven't changed, just the headers have changed. We took off HR coordinator and assistant treasurer and in its place put um, payroll officer. Um, and then you will see that the next item here is the job description revision for payroll officer, updated it with some language for what really happened for that particular position. And uh, we'll be posting for this position here shortly. Uh, this position in June will replace, or actually July 1st, will, will replace Mrs. Wagner. And then the Board of Education, I would like to thank you on behalf of the class of 2015 for um, your, well, it's not voted on yet, I'm hoping, the generous donation to the after prom committee of $1,500 that will go a long way. This year's after prom is at Tailored Elegance, and I know the after prom committee is working hard to put together a nice evening for our graduates, so thank you for your donation. Yeah, and this is something that the board has done annually. The students um, have uh, a safe place to go after the prom, and the board has always felt that it's appropriate that we take some of the funds out of the board services fund and contribute to that. Uh, we believe it's just a matter of safety to give uh, those students an opportunity to go someplace and enjoy themselves but be safe in doing so. Uh, and then, as always, there's several donations on here, so just a thank you to all of those companies that have provided uh, some sort of resource or funds to our schools. It's always very much appreciated. Any other comments tonight? Roll call, please. Mrs. Kane Grizzle? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Terrell Walden? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. Mr. Stuber? Yes. Those nine items passed 5-0. Lastly, on the agenda under new business, we have item J10. And due to the importance, I think I'll read this in total. Whereas the Twinsburg Board of Education desires to share its concern with legislators regarding the implementation of the new assessments administered under the Ohio Revised Code in the 2014-2015 school year, and whereas the Twinsburg Board of Education advocates for public education, and whereas the Twinsburg Board of Education believes in the importance of accountability as it relates to academic success of the students in the Twinsburg City School District, and whereas the Twinsburg Board of Education supports the concerns of superintendents and other professional educators expressed to legislators in Ohio regarding the amount of testing required for students in grades three through 12, and whereas the Twinsburg Board of Education also believes that testing requirements as currently mandated will seriously impact critical instruction time in our schools to the detriment of our students' education. And whereas the Twinsburg Board of Education believes that the current assessment format mandated by the Ohio Department of Education is untested and unpredictable as noted by the fact that a cut score has not yet been established. And whereas House Bill 7, as proposed, attempts to address the testing requirements by prohibiting individual student scores from certain elementary and secondary achievement assessments administered for the 2014-2015 school year from being used to determine promotion or retention or to grant course credit. However, the Twinsburg Board of Education believes that House Bill 7 should address certain important issues related to the test results, including their impact on the district report card district funding and teacher administrator evaluations. So therefore, be it resolved that the Twinsburg Board of Education requests that the Ohio Legislature institute a one-year moratorium on all accountability measures for students, teachers, and districts as related to the new state assessment requirements until a full analysis of the results of the assessments is conducted. A review of the testing procedures is conducted with recommendations for improved testing protocols, including the reduction of testing time for state-mandated assessments. I will make the motion for this resolution. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Felber. Is there any discussion regarding this particular motion? 
Roll call, please. Mr. Stuver? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. Mrs. Kane Criswell? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Pearl Waldron? Yes. That motion passes 5 0. Next on the agenda is miscellaneous. Is there anything? Um, I'll start with the board. My colleagues, anything? Uh, quick any? shout out and congratulations to uh, Springfield High School Orchestra. I believe the competition is OCEA. OMEA. Uh, what is it? OMEA. OAMEA. One of those uh, acronyms. But uh, they have the opportunity when they're, they're judged to get rated on a 1 2 3 scale, one being superior. And I'm uh, happy to report that they were rated superior again. So congratulations to the orchestra and to Mr. Kahn. Kids were very excited. You know, they uh, uh, they work very very hard. Uh, you know, they're in, in class. That's a uh, on every block class, 90 minutes, and uh, that's every day. So for those who are not following the block scheduling, you know, alternating days, um, this is an orchestra that's practicing every single day for, for 90 minutes. So working very hard. So congratulations to them. And I just also wanted to, in conjunction with um, talking a lot about the Rotary tonight. They did, um, some of the Interact children um, did a four-way test speech contest, I guess I'm trying to come up with the right terminology, last Wednesday at um, Brewster's. And it was very interesting. It was the first one I've ever been to. And it was amazing how they were able to present um, the, the four-way test that the Rotary uses as their um, as their standards for the Rotary. And um, also, I just want to let everyone know the Rotary meets every Wednesday at noon at Brewster's. And um, Mr. Joyce will be our speaker next Wednesday. So those of you that are interested in, you know, attending, I'm opening an invitation to all of you. So next Wednesday at noon at Brewster's, um, Mr. Joyce will be there. And um, I think, you know, it'd be nice to see some fresh faces in there for the Rotary meeting. So thank you. Just two things. I wanted to uh, publicly thank the members of the Experience for the Vocal Music Group who was last Saturday. It was the North Coast uh, Show Choir Invitational, and our school district hosted 17 show choirs from across the region. You know, and our students didn't compete. They don't compete when they host the event, but uh, they had a tradition of great expectations, exposition of the uh, RBC singers and of uh, the newest show choir, which is the Mead Singers and did a phenomenal job as usual. But more than that board, I just want to tell you how proud I was of our students because they served in the capacity of hostess and hostesses for the entire day. Uh, it so happened that Saturday morning, we had an alarm drop at RBC at 5.30 a.m. and I was there with the police department. So I thought I'd stop by the high school and see what was going on at the high school about six o'clock. And our parents were already here with our students getting ready for a very busy day. They were here through midnight. And uh, they were phenomenal hostess and hostesses and um, just did a great job. And I wanted to congratulate the CVMB for once again um, doing a, a phenomenal um, fundraiser for our show choirs. The kids go a lot of places, and it takes a lot of funds to um, be able to support the copyrights on music and the uh, costumes and transportation. So thank you to all the moms and dads that were here. What's interesting, when they host those kinds of events, much like the TABS tournament, we have alumni parents that come back. And they know that every year there's the TAP tournament, and every year there's the North Coast Show Choir Invitational, and they come back. Their kids could be gone for 10 years, and they're here helping out. So we do appreciate um, all the support. And then finally, next week, March 12th, is an important event for our parents. If they're interested, it is the Hidden in Plain Sight Parent Workshop, 7 o'clock at RBC. We hosted this event about two years ago. It's in collaboration with the Clinford Police Department and the Copley Fairland Police Department. And Mrs. Chapagan is uh, the force behind it this, this year. And uh, this is the opportunity for parents to come and uh, walk through and, and learn about um, a child's bedroom and things that could be in a child's bedroom that could be potentially dangerous right in plain sight. You don't even know it. So we look forward to uh, many parents. Last time it was standing room only. This time it's at the RBC gym. And um, we look forward to uh, hosting this event. Um, I think doors open at 6, Denise, is that right? for parents to walk through this mock uh, teenager's bedroom, and then the program will start at 7. So uh, please join us. Uh, this is an adult-only um, workshop, and uh, we expect a crowd and another great event. Thank you. Uh, I'm reminded of Mrs. Powers' credit um, plus presentation tomorrow. Tomorrow is the educational options night at the high school.
it's also an opportunity for next year's freshmen, this year's current eighth graders to learn about the high school schedule. It is an opportunity for our parents to learn about College Credit Plus, which is one of the new education programs for next school year. So it's starting at six at the high school with the uh, educational options program presented by Mrs. Tringle and her uh, guidance staff. And then at, at seven, uh, Mrs. Tringle will be talking specifically with the un incoming class this year's eighth graders about course options for next year. Very good. Anything else? We do have need for an executive session this evening. I will make the motion that the Board of Education enters into executive session at 8.56 p.m. to consider the discipline and dismissal and employment of public employees as per Board of Education Policy 0166, paragraph A. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Davis. Just a note that there will be no action taken at the end of this executive session. Roll call, please. Mr. Stuber? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Kane Criswell? Yes. Mrs. Carol Waldron? Yes. Mr. Felber? Yes. That motion passes 5-0. I want to thank everybody for their patience in staying tonight. The board will now move into executive session.